Okay, everybody. Today's lecture is about analysis of Boolean functions, one of my favorite topics, sometimes called Fourier analysis of Boolean functions. So that word connects it a little bit with yesterday's or the last lecture. Uh, so this is a sort of mathematical uh, tools associated with studying Boolean functions. And in this lecture, I'm going to kind of tell you all the basic formalism and the definitions and so forth. And then at the end, we probably won't have time to really do some applications, so I'll just tell you some applications then. Uh, it's a little bit hard to specify, you know, when these tools are useful. I tried to like write an extremely vague uh, set of criteria here, like, you know, if you have a Boolean function in your hands or a subset of the Boolean cube, it's the same thing. And like somehow flipping input bits or like XORing input bits is relevant to your problem. And maybe somehow counting input strings or the uniform probability distribution on strings is relevant to your problem then you may be able to use these tools from Fourier analysis of Boolean functions. Uh, but it's a little bit hard to say. It's like, you know, asking when should you try to use combinatorics to solve a problem. I don't know if you're counting something. Uh, so Fourier analysis of Boolean functions is a major tool in quite a few areas of CS theory, both uh, areas that we're going to talk about, like literally in this course, like quantum computing, communication complexity, learning theory, hardness of approximation, PCPs, pseudo-randomness. Also, other topics that we're not going to talk about in this course, like concrete complexity, random graph theory, additive combinatorics, metric spaces, social choice, uh, lots of different areas. So I hope you'll find some occasion to use this uh, set of tools in your life. OK, so <clears throat> as it says right there in the title, uh, this topic is concerned with uh, Boolean functions. Like, what more basic object is there in computer science, really, than the Boolean function? Now, here's how you're most used to writing the classic Boolean function, so a function mapping n bit strings into one bit. And uh, one thing that's both uh, kind of annoying about this topic, but something you've got to get used to right away, is it's very important to be flexible about how you represent bits. So normally you represent bits, or like true and false, with 0 and 1 in computer science. But uh, there's a couple of different ways that I'm going to prefer to represent them in this class. Uh, and I'm even going to make different choices for the domain and the range, which is a little bit weird. Uh, but you just got to get used to it. So for the domain, sometimes I'm going to think about it as, um, instead of just thinking about it as you know, binary strings, I'll write it as uh, f2 to the n. Really, I just mean here uh, a fancy way to say vectors of length n, where the you know, elements are numbers mod 2. OK? And that'll be somewhat important because, you know, when you add two numbers mod 2, uh, that's the same as XORing them, right? And as I said, somehow, like, XORing, uh, flipping bits plays an important role in this, this tar topic. Uh, but also, sometimes I'll change my mind and instead write it as, like this, uh, I'll use plus or minus 1 instead of 0 and 1. And where I think of these two numbers, plus or minus 1, as real numbers. And uh, it's maybe not so weird to use plus or minus 1 instead of 0 and 1 for bits. And one reason we're going to like to do this is, again, if you think of plus or minus 1 as real numbers, and you think of, and this is stressfully weird, if you think of like negative 1 as representing true and plus 1 as representing false, then again, multiplying becomes the same as XOR, right? Uh, I guess maybe, yeah. So uh, this will be like very convenient. Uh, so you'll just have to get uh, used to accepting that. And as for the range, well, especially in this uh, particular lecture, I'm always going to use, or often going to use, this uh, plus or minus 1 notation. to represent the two possible output bits. And I'm also often going to generalize to range R, which is also a little bit funny, but this is a hallmark of analysis of Boolean functions. We're not just going to think of um, functions mapping n-bit strings to bits, but in general functions that map n-bit uh, Boolean strings into real numbers. And you know, the case of main interest is when those two real numbers happen to be plus or minus 1, or 0 and 1. But it's going to be very useful to allow this generalization. 
OK, so the upshot is you know, when we start studying Boolean functions here, I'll often say something like, OK, let's say we have a Boolean function. And so I may just write it like this. Mapping n plus or minus 1s into plus or minus 1. Or I might write this. It's mapping vectors of length n of numbers uh, 0 and 1 mod 2 into plus or minus 1. Or these might even in general be mapping into the real numbers. OK. <clears throat> um, so really, this analysis of Boolean functions uh, boils down to representing a given Boolean function that you're interested in as a polynomial. You know, usually you think of a Boolean function as being given to you maybe by a truth table. That's the most explicit way to get it. Uh, and this topic analysis of Boolean functions involves finding a different representation, a polynomial representation for it. And indeed, uh, Sort of just like in last lecture, we're going to be talking about the sometimes called the Walsh Fourier transform or the Hadamard Fourier transform. I'll just call it the Fourier transform here. And uh, just like last time, it's going to be all about interpolating uh, f's values with a polynomial. Uh, OK, so in fact, the main difference from last time is that uh, last time we were talking about univariate polynomials. And in this uh, lecture, we're going to be talking about uh, n-variate polynomials. But I'm going to start with a simple example. So like, here's a very, very simple boole uh, Boolean function. Let's say f is the majority of 3 function. OK, so it maps uh, 3 uh, bits, which I'll write as plus or minus 1 to the 3 into plus or minus 1. OK, and the output on a bit string of length 3 is just the, most, the more frequent uh, truth value. OK, so one way to represent this function is with a, like a truth table. x1, x2, x3, and then the majority of 3. It's going to uh, be some table of height uh, 8. So the first row, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. The majority is plus 1 x row plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, uh, minus 1. Majority is still plus 1. OK, five more rows. And then the last row is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. And the majority of that is minus 1. OK, that's a very simple Boolean function. And <clears throat> as I stressed a couple times here, uh, it's good to think of these uh, plus or minus 1s as real numbers. And you can therefore think of this as, um, with a geometric picture, you can think of these as uh, three-dimensional vectors, or like eight points, the corners of a cube in space. And this is like a labeling of these points by some values. So sort of the geometric picture of this uh, Boolean function is like a labeling of the three-dimensional cube, where each vertex is labeled by the function value. So let me try to draw this. OK, so well, those should have been dashed. Anyway, this is R3. And these eight points here are like the eight points with uh, Boolean coordinates, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. This is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. Maybe this is plus 1, plus 1, minus 1. Well, I don't know. I've drawn the axes in a weird way, but they're labeled in this way. and. Uh, Actually, let me try to make it less ridiculous. Let's call this one back here plus and uh, minus, minus, plus. I'll try to make these minus. OK, so somehow this way is minus and uh, this way is plus. OK, and the function majority of three labels each vertex by a number. So like it sort of labels this one by the majority of these three things, which is minus one. Put that in a square. This one gets labeled by minus 1. This one gets labeled by plus 1, and so forth. 
And what we'd like to do, as I said, is instead of you know, just taking this, uh, this uh, truth table viewpoint on the function or this uh, labeled data viewpoint on the function, we want to fit a polynomial to this function. It's going to be a three variable polynomial that interpolates this uh, function values. And it's pretty easy trick to uh, do this when you're finding polynomials that fit data on the corners of a cube or a hypercube, these Boolean values. And the trick is to bring into the picture some like indicator polynomials for each of the vertices of the hypercube. And that won't be too tricky. So what I want to say is, okay, the majority of x, and I'm going to usually use this notation x stands for x, the vector x1 through xn. This in general is going to mean x1 through xn. In our example, n is 3, and these x's are going to be, we're interested in their, them taking on plus or minus 1 values. Uh, okay, so what I want to do is, again, I kind of want to find the interpolating polynomial or a polynomial that fits this data like one vertex at a time. So I'm going to start with this uh, lower left vertex, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, where the label is supposed to be minus 1. So I'm going to start by writing this, half minus a half x1 times half minus a half x2 times half minus a half x3. That's some kind of polynomial. <coughs> And what have I uh, got on my hand so far? You see, if you plug in minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 here, then all these factors become 1, 1, 1. They multiply to 1. Okay? If you plug in any other of the seven coordinates, the corners of the cube, well, at least one of them will be plus 1. And for the associated factor, it'll become 0. And the whole thing will become 0. Okay, so this little expression is 1 exactly on this lower left corner of the cube and zero elsewhere. So what we can do now is like multiply this polynomial by sort of the f's label for that uh, corner of the cube, which happened to be minus one. Okay, so times, well, minus one. And now we sort of got the function, a polynomial which gets the function right on minus one, minus one, minus one. And it's you know, zero elsewhere. So we just have to do this same operation on the other seven points and add everything up. So let's do that. We'll move on to that second point there, minus, minus, plus. And we'll similarly use half minus half x1, half minus half x2, half plus half x3. Okay, and you can see that this expression here, the second expression is 1 at minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. All the factors are 1. And it's 0 on any uh, you know, sign, choice of signs for x1, x2, x3, which is not this minus, minus, plus, uh, which is good. So it's sort of the indicator for the, that kind of bottom right-ish corner. And we multiply this by what f's value is down there, which happens to be minus 1 again in our case. And it's good. Now this polynomial so far is getting the right answer on the bottom right kind of point. And it didn't mess up that it was getting the right answer here either because uh, this polynomial is 0 everywhere else besides the bottom right point. OK, so we can do this for all the other points. And the last one will be half plus a half x1, the top right guy, half plus a half x2, half plus a half x3 times the label of the top right uh, point, the function value majority 3 on all pluses, which is plus 1. And now, finally, we're done. So this should be a polynomial in x1, x2, x3, which you know computes the majority function on all Boolean strings of length 3. Yeah? This looks tedious and hard coded. Is there like a more elegant way of writing the same expression that you get? Oh, hang in there. Yeah, it's going to be, well. Uh, it's going to be uh, uh, much better. It is kind of tedious. Well, I'll give you a clue. Uh, if, if you write capital N to be 2 to the little n, uh, this task will take you n square, capital N squared time, but you should be able to do it in capital N log n time uh, later. But um, 
Yeah, we'll start with this uh, method just to assure you that uh, it can be done sort of for any Boolean function. <coughs> and actually, if you do this and um, expand it all out, or more accurately, have your computer expand it all out for you, you will get something that's less ugly. You'll get uh, a half x1 plus a half x2 plus a half x3 minus a half x1, x2, x3. So in fact, like tons of cal cancellation happens, and you get this. And now you can check this, right? It's actually not so bad. Like if you plug, let's say, 1, 1, 1 into this, you'll get half plus half plus half minus a half, which is 1, which is the majority of 1, 1, 1. If you plug in like plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, you'll get like plus a half, plus a half, minus a half. But then this will be plus a half. So you'll get 1 again, which is correct. And you can check the other six cases. Um, so good. So we got a nice polynomial. It's simplified out. Uh, and this is uh, a polynomial that sort of computes the majority of three function in this plus or minus one notation. Uh, let's try to do another example, but I'll leave it to you. Let's consider the function, I'll call it parity sub 3, or you might call it xor sub 3, of uh, x1, x2, x3. Uh, it should be the xor of these three truth values, or the, the parity of the three truth values, maybe under this interpretation. Does anybody know the polynomial that computes this? Yes? Yeah, it's x1, x2, x3. Uh, it's exactly cooked up, and then you know, the niceness of the plus or minus 1 notation is you have this very simple polynomial. It's just a monomial, which computes the parity or the XOR of all the bits. Uh, great. And I should emphasize that this is uh, you know, heavily using this fact that we're representing the range by real numbers plus or minus 1. Uh, I will not talk about, in this class, representing uh, functions that map you know, uh, n-bit vectors mod 2 into numbers mod 2. Uh, these can also be represented by polynomials. And in this world, parity sub 3 of x1, x2, x3 is x1 plus x2 x plus x3 mod 2. So that's confusing, but well, forget about this for this lecture. Uh, we're going to be sticking with this you know, real value plus or minus 1 notation. <coughs> Great. So uh, I like to point out one other thing here. This is not just uh, any polynomial. Both these polynomials happen to be multilinear. Multilinear just means like the highest power of any variable is 1. So there's like no xi squareds or higher powers of xi. And you can see if you use this recipe, you will never get any squares or anything. And it kind of makes sense that you would never need to use a square, like xi squared, if you're trying to build a polynomial to compute a Boolean function. Uh, where the bits are plus or minus 1, because if you only care about when xi's are plus or minus 1, then xi squared will always be 1. So if you had an xi squared, you could just erase it or convert it to a 1. So I claim by this example that you should agree to the following theorem, that, um, well, basically, every Boolean function can be represented as a multilinear polynomial. OK, you just do this interpolation trick for uh, you know, the n, 2 to the n vertices of a n uh, bit cube. Or you just multiply all the function values against these indicator polynomials. Uh -huh. How is the polynomial mapping everything to true multilinear? Ah, uh, the polynomial that maps everything to true is the polynomial f of x you know, 1 through xn is uh, 1. Or I guess minus one, but whichever. And uh, yeah, this is a multilinear polynomial. It just means that there are no xi squareds. 
Uh, there are no xi's either, but that's okay. It's a degree zero polynomial. Okay, so sort of the fundamental theorem, I guess, of analysis of Boolean functions is this. Every function f mapping m bit strings to, and now I was going to write, you know, bits because we're used to talking about Boolean functions. But you see, actually, it would be perfectly fine if I did this trick for functions whose range happened to be r, you know, functions that like gave a real value label to every corner of the cube. Because, you know, there's no trouble in me putting like any, any real numbers here. I would still get like a, a multilinear polynomial. So I can extend to this more general case. Uh, is expressible as a multilinear polynomial. Okay. Um, let me also throw in the word uniquely here. I've not really proved that, but uh, it will become clear that it's unique by the end of the lecture. Or you can think about now why the answer is uh, unique. Yep. Um, what exactly do you mean by multilinear here? I mean a polynomial. You know what a polynomial is? Um, where the highest power of any variable is one. So like these are all multilinear and like, you know, three plus x1 plus 2x squared x, x, I don't know, x2x squared x5 is not multilinear because of this too. Okay. Uh, I should throw in real here. Okay, so is that uh, theorem, maybe aside from the uniquely part, uh, sound okay? We've kind of proven it by construction. Uh, okay, now what is the general form of a multilinear polynomial in n variables? Uh, uh, multilinear polynomial in n variables can have uh, how many different terms? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. That's right. So there's two to the end. A general, like, if I just want to write down a general multilinear polynomial, uh, it'll be like a linear combination of monomials like this. And each monomial, you know, every variable either appears in it or doesn't, or has power zero or one in it. Um, yeah, so there's like one possible monomial for every subset, capital S, of the n variables. Right? So the most, you know, a general form of a multilinear polynomial looks like this. Sum over subsets S of this notation is from your homework. Brackets n means 1, 2, 3 up to n. Uh, some real coefficient c sub s, and then times the associated monomial, product over i and s of xi. OK. Uh, by the way, uh, product over i in an empty set, xi, stands for 1 by convention. OK, so like the constant coefficient here is C sub empty set. <clears throat> so uh, great. Every Boolean function can be represented by a polynomial that looks like this. And I want to change the notation a little bit. Uh, one thing that's not too nice about this notation is it doesn't show the dependence of the, these are the coefficients. These are real numbers doesn't show the dependence of these coefficients on the function f. So the usual notation is not uh, cs, but it's this, f hat s. OK, so this is a real number. And I'll, I'll rewrite it in here. Is it OK? Do you have a question? OK, so this that looks a little funny. It's got some funny symbols in it. Uh, this is called the Fourier expansion of f. Uh, 
But as I said, it's really just you know, writing f as a polynomial. And these coefficients here against the monomials are called the Fourier coefficients. Uh, and I want to make one more observation while I'm looking at this. All these monomials here, if you think about this monomial just by itself, it's also a function of the xi's. It's the product of the xi's where i is in this set, subset s of coordinates. And actually, even nicer, it's a Boolean valued function. For every input x, this monomial outputs plus or minus 1. And as we talked about here, it even has like a, like a, a meaning. It's the parity or the XOR of the bits in x from the set s. So like these monomials here, as you vary capital S, are like these two to the n different monomials are all the functions that are like parity of a certain subset of the input bits. And this is really like writing f is like a linear combination of these functions. So somehow like majority of three function is like you take half times the, well, the parity of the first bit, half plus the parity of the second bit, half plus the parity of the third bit, and then subtract half the parity of all the bits. <clears throat> okay, so if you're used, you know, from calculus, you know, Fourier series, like representing functions as like linear combinations of sines and cosines, this is the same thing, except it's representing Boolean functions of linear combinations of XOR functions. Okay, so let's get a little bit used to this notation. Uh, Okay, we're still going to use this majority of three function as an example. Well, I can leave it up. Uh, so let's figure out what its Fourier coefficients are. So what is this quantity? Majority sub 3 hat of the singleton set 1. What's that? Half, yeah. This is this whole thing represents a number. It represents the number of half. It's just saying that the coefficient up there on the monomial that just includes x1 is a half. And that's also majority sub 3 hat of 2. And it's also majority sub 3 hat of 3. And we also have majority sub 3 hat. One, two, three is minus a half. And all the other Fourier coefficients are zero. Okay, so you know majority sub three hat s is sort of the the coefficient on the parity of the s bits function in this linear combination. Or similarly, uh, if we think of this function, parity of all the bits, hat, one, two, three, this is one, and all the other Fourier coefficients are zero. That's this uh, second one. Actually, let's do the third one that's also up there. Let's say the function which always outputs true, f of x is always negative 1. Uh, if you want to write this as a polynomial in x1 through xn, well, you've already done it. This is the polynomial right here, minus 1. So we have f hat empty set is minus 1, and f hat s is 0 otherwise. Any questions? Yeah? Um, what's the actual range of the Fourier coefficients? How do you mean? Based on the Hakori expansion, what is the actual set of values the Fourier coefficients can take? Oh, what are the set of uh, uh, Fourier coefficients, uh, what are the set of values the Fourier coefficients can take? Great question. Uh, 
So if you're concerned with functions who uh, map n-bit strings to reals, then the Fourier coefficients can be completely arbitrary real numbers. And indeed, this gives you like a sense of this uh, uniqueness, right? Like every real valued Boolean function is specified by just two to the n real numbers. And every multilinear polynomial is also just specified by two to the n real numbers, the coefficients. So this, that's not a proof that like there's you know one-to-one -one correspondence, but it's a, it's a pretty good indication. On the other hand, if you restrict attention to the functions that we really care about, the ones whose range are plus or minus one, then it's true that not all coefficients become possible. It's hard to say, uh, it's not easy to say an exact characterization of which ones become possible. But I'll say one true thing that we'll get to at the end of the lecture. Uh, if you have a Boolean valued function, the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients is always one. That's not, you know, that's uh, necessary but not sufficient. So you can see here you get half squared plus half squared plus half squared plus negative half squared is one. One squared plus a bunch of zero squares is one. Uh, this should have said minus one. Nobody caught me on that. You should speak up when I make like, such an obvious mistake. Uh, negative one squared plus a bunch of zero squares is one, and so forth. OK. Um, so yeah, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about your earlier question, namely, you know, how do we go about computing these coefficients from, uh, let's say, the truth table in like a less annoying way, if possible. And you might also wonder, why do I even want to do this at all? Like, why, why do I want to compute these coefficients? It turns out, and hopefully this will be, to, be a bit of a recurring theme in this lecture, um, if you can compute these coefficients for a, a Boolean function that interests you, it's usually great because um, they encode a lot of interesting information about the function. So a lot of uh, interesting combinatorial properties about the Boolean function can be read off from these coefficients. Okay, so I'll try to give some examples of that throughout the lecture. 